everyone, yes. Cool, so thanks everyone for joining for this catch up meeting added. When was, when was Transform? June, July, a couple of months ago. Uh, same setting, pandemic, everybody home, so nothing changed. <laughs> so I think it's the reason we're here is actually Florian. Uh, you asked once in the chat, in the Slack chat, what's the state of the art, right? I think so. So I thought it, it would be good to just sit together and, and uh, have a chat. Mostly active was actually Miguel. So I think he also going to start and then we can have some discussions. He told me he has some points he would like to have consent on to move on. So Miguel. Yeah. So yes. So anybody has any comments before? <laughs> okay, I should. Uh, I can share my screen. I cannot. Peter? Let me see. So I, I've been just working a bit on design ideas, and then I also started to to change the whole structure of the package. So today, today would be cool if we agree a bit on the more high level ideas of what this package should be. Uh, and also more into the detail if the, the structures, the data structures that I have in mind and the different levels of abstraction make sense for everybody or, or someone uh, feels that something is missing so we can just at least add it and uh, make sure that we are not doing something uncomfortable. So I added, uh, or I, I just wrote in the Slack channel a HackMD, but that's what I'm going to share here. Yeah, you should be able to share now. Yeah. Are you seeing the which is green? Oh. Yes, yeah. that's good. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. So very general basic thoughts that I was just writing when when I started to work again in this a couple of weeks ago. So the, the idea of this is, is just having this data hub for scientific geoscientific data in in Python. So two main purposes, unified geometric data that most of the libraries understand. At the moment, for each of these libraries, uh, we are writing our own parsers for most of the data. And I think that that is not the best, the best idea. And then the basic interaction with those data objects. So write, read, different formats, maybe some metadata and categories for the more high level libraries, and then some basic visualization. So a couple of requirements that I wanted to this library. So, so the problem of this is that in the moment that we start adding a lot of uh, formats, then we are going to need a lot of dependencies. So what we have to really try is to keep the core light. So my idea is that the only requirements to be NumPy and Pandas and XRA maybe, and all the rest optional. So depending if you want to just deal with one format or, or the other. And then that the import output has to be at the level of primary structures. So, so really at the most level, uh, most basic level of, of data that I will come back to, to this point in a second. But, but not trying to just in, import or read data already in super complex objects, but really try to read the data to the most basic type of objects and build from there. So a couple of ideas of the libraries that I'm having in mind and actually I'm using and so for input output, segwayo for, for seismic, welly is the one that welly and strip lock for the borehole data, raster IO for cloud points and, and these things. For visualization at the moment, I'm using mainly PyVista, but I can imagine that we could have also Matplotlib for the 2D. And then this is a, one of the main things that we have to discuss today, if how all of this comes together with these standard formats like open mining format or, or the geo h5 pi that dom is making but the general idea of, of the data levels i call them so, so <laughs> from computer to to human it's really just use numpy array always for memory allocation so if we want to put labels to those NumPy arrays using data frame and X-Array for attributes and things like this. Uh, and this being the, the main 
constructor of, of what I call primary structures. So, so far it's just unstructured data, unstructured data. And I can show you later a bit what these are made, but, but these are really just numerical data. And using that numerical data to go already to some type of geometry that I'll call elements. So these are more something that VTK, for example, can understand and we can plot easily with PyVista. And then if we want to go a step further, we can just go to geological objects. So how those geometries, they create actually faults or, or seismic lines or bringing yet already ge uh, geology concepts to the geometries. And beyond that, if you want to add from which borehole is, is coming, the, who made the interpretation, we will really need to embed all of this in, in data structures that they contain a lot of strings and, and metadata. But here, I guess that is where OMF and this, these ideas come into play. So said that, so far I built this unstructured data that is composed by three attributes, vertex with the XYZ data, edges that connects the vertex, depending on the size of the, so how many columns the edges has, is going to be either point cloud, lines, triangles, uh, or volumetric elements, and then assign attributes to those edges at the moment. So those elements that they, they are connect, the connection of the edges. This was a discussion that we were having one minute ago with Bain, if we also need attributes that they are related to the point of clouds and probably we are going to need that. So attributes of the same length as edges and attributes of the same length as vertex. Ah, yeah. So depending on the size of the edges, we are going to have the different either point cloud lines, mesh, tetrahedrons and so. And then we have a structured data that this is going to be directly an X-array. Same Mike, story. Jump yep. in with a quick question yes. on unstructured. So if we do have just a point cloud, so there are no edges connecting, connecting those vertices, is the shape then of edges, is that an empty array or what, what does that look like? At, at the moment I'm allowing anything. So it could be an empty array or what? Uh, I think that you need an array of, of the shape uh, and, and they can be zero or one, but yes, that's not used. Okay. But uh, those are a bit details of implementation, but yes, I, I, I want it to exist because I want it to be as consistent as possible for all the, the type of, of data structures. But yes, in that case, we wouldn't use, so could be yes, the indices say yes, from one to N. Okay, okay, fair enough, thanks. Yes, and for the structured data, yes, make an X array. Same idea. So if it's 2D, will be structured surfaces. If it's 3D, it's structured grids. And then the special case of a uniform grid that can be just defined by, by the extent and the resolution because the tape size is the same. Yeah. So what do you think <laughs> of all of this? So, so, so this is a, is a bit my, my thoughts. Uh, and I think that this, what, what I can call here primary structures, that is really an structured data object and a structured data object, are a bit the things that I'm, I'm really feeling that is missing in, in the community. Yeah. So, so something that imports into a primary structure, so something that exports from primary structures to files, and then that different softwares, they are able to, to yes, read these primary structures and understand what they are. All the rest, adds value, obviously, uh, and context. But for me, this is, is a bit the, the sweet spot. Um, any chance, Miguel, you think we could attach um, some, some attributes to, uh, to a primary structure? I'm just thinking uh, it would be so awesome if we could have, uh, if we could as a group define, you know, a set of keyword arguments that are, that are reserved, for instance, I don't know, just like, I don't know, color map, right? I could attach a color map to a, to a primary structure that PyVista would, would see and then would, it would pick it up and flood it with the right color map. You know what I mean? Just be able to attach some, like, uh, like a JSON or something to it, or I'm not sure. 
Oh, and I hear you, Miguel. Sorry, <laughs> I had it closed. Yes. So, so, so my idea is yes, leaving primary structures just with numerical data. And then if you want to add more, like what, exactly what you have said, you go up into the pilot and you just compose a primary structure within an element or within a geological format or something like that. But, but using composition for that. So just really leaving primary structures as, as it is, the numerical data. And if you want to add metadata, just create a class that one of the properties is a primary structure. And, and for example, I, I can imagine that the, the, the same for, for this geo h 5 pi that you are working on. Eh? So the, the idea is, is that one of the attributes could be one of these. Makes sense. So one of the um, one of the issues you run into with metadata that, that I've sort of seen rear its um, its head in, for example, well log data. Um, so I think Welly has a big dictionary of of yep. what you know gamma ray can be called, for example. So there's capital G R, there's little G R, there's gamma underscore ray, there's gamma space ray. Right? It's just the list goes on, and then gamma ray final, gamma ray final final, like gamma ray clip final, but you know that sort of thing. So. I, I, um, I, I agree completely. So in, in the moment that you go it, through the metadata route, I feel that it's impossible to, to agree in anything. Eh? <laughs> yeah, it gets, so there's an NSF initiative um, that's called um, Strabo or Strabo. I don't actually know how to pronounce that, but they have an app and it's to collect field data. It's like outcrop data. And it started out being structural measurements. So you know, you would have a lat long point with, uh, you know, strike and dip and, you know, uh, a photo or something like that. And they're trying to take it into um, sedimentary uh, graphic logs now, right? So like a core description. And it's super messy, right? Because everyone wants a different scale and everyone wants a different, um, you know, format. Some people are looking at carbonate, some people are looking at clastics. And so it gets really, it's not a simple, you know, this sort of geological format, right? Like, well, you know, what do you, even for something um, simple, like a fault, right? I mean, there's, there's even a lot of, um, I mean, I guess that's kind of what we need to do, right? But, we need but, to but, define. But maybe that, and, and it's true that this, I mean, graph, which is obviously a graph doesn't represent, but my idea a bit is having it like an inverse pyramid uh, where in the only thing that we are going to be able to agree is to the level of structured data and unstructured data. Those are really concepts that doesn't matter what do you build on top, it's the yeah. same. As we are building or moving upwards, closer to a human understand or readable format, there is many. So, so I, here I'm not intending to make yet another one. I'm intending to accommodate what is already there, but, but still building on the base of the pyramid. So, so instead just having several independent uh, formats that they build the whole stack themselves, just trying to at least agree on the, on the basis. And, and once you just go from, from NumPy array to, to a representation of a line and, and using the, the line to represent a borehole and then the borehole to represent a data set, that is going to diverge. And, and, and that's, I don't know if it's going to be part of subsurface or, or those libraries should import sub, subsurface. That's a bit a, a question for, for someone as Dominic, if what makes more sense. If, if import subsurface in, in Geo H5Pi or the other way around, import Geo H5Pi into subsurface. I, I think the packages should adapt to to, uh, to, uh, to what we're doing here. This should be the, the basis and we just have wrappers on our app on, yeah. on each other's side to be able to understand what those, uh, what those structures are. If we're talking about here creating a common, a common structure, this should be it, right? And then, because we're, it's going to be much harder to, I think, uh, connect all our packages, reformat our packages to all agree with each other. We should just be doing it. No, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So, so for me, the only question is the, if we make a function just to import a file. So, so in that file, there is going to be numerical data that we can just extract and place it in, in one of these primary structures. Uh, the question is, what do we do with all the metadata around? So, so if, if the function in subsurface is only looking to the numerical, then you are going to need a function in whatever other library 
to import also the metadata. That, that's the biggest problem I see of having it separated. But yeah, I was, I was going to ask, for example, if you, if you take something from, say, PyGimli and you want to move it into GemPy or something, I, I mean, I don't know if that's feasible, but what do you do in terms of, you, you, like, you can read in the, the, the numbers and everything, but then there still needs to be some level of cooperation above your primary structures in order to say, okay, well, you know, PyGimli is only, I mean, maybe PyGimli doesn't give us lines, but it's giving us this, this, and this. And then when GemPy reads it in, it needs to know how to deal with, you know, some sort of a line coming in from subsurf or whatever we call it. Yes. So, um, so, so at some that point, was my question was if you thought where that might go. Um, we, we are going to need to, to write custom objects. The, the only question is we could just use anything any numerica, so any NumPy array in any format, and just create this object that is how we communicate um, by Gimli and GemPy, we can really try to, to follow a bit this idea of, okay, first of all, is it structured data or is unstructured data? If it's unstructured data, it's a line, it's a triangle, it's, it's, it's a tetrahedron. If it's a tetrahedron, then you use that element. And then if you want to add more metadata on top, maybe you have to create a new object. But, but just trying to create as, as fewer new objects as possible. That's a bit. <laughs> That's why I have the feeling that if we just have, if we just allow to attach dictionaries, and then we know that let's say PyGamely can accept uh, some attribute on a, on a curve object, then when you pass this this attribute to the curve object through through uh, through this library, then you know what's going to happen, right? How how can other libraries can Handle it. So I think we kind of need to have this, those like reserve keywords that if, if it's not going to use them, then it's, it's just going to be passed in as a dictionary is going to skip through the keyword and it's not going to use it. But if it encounters something that it recognizes then all libraries agree that this is a, you know, <laughs> and a keyword that we all accept that it does something. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. No, so, so I, I agree with, with that. The question is, we can just put a dictionary here in the class, just as another property. Or we can assume that if you need a dictionary, you have to compose uh, the unstructured data object in a different class. Because maybe a dictionary is not enough. Eh? Maybe for communicating to libraries, you need a dictionary and whatever. <laughs> uh, so then it would be better to just define its own class. I don't know. In some senses, maybe one way to reason through this is also perhaps just starting from actually the user perspective. And so not necessarily worrying about where we are in the, in the stack, but I could see like as a user reading in um, a GOH5 file and having either the option to read in sort of like everything and basically have the metadata in sort of a dictionary bucket like what Dom has suggested and and perhaps that is a higher level object where we basically have you know unstructured data plus meta yeah. um, and then the meta is then we maybe have you know a handful of lightweight methods and maybe as a first pass it just is a dictionary and we can figure out if there's more complex data we'll figure that out later um, but having, having that separation there where as the user, I define, like, I just want the bare basics. I just want like only my primary structures being read in, or I would like to actually read in this whole file, chuck whatever else you don't know how to deal with into a dictionary. And like, now it's on me to figure that out. That's, uh, I like that idea of, of, of yes, whatever is not numbers, you just put it in a dictionary and, and then something as uh, Geo5, Geo H5 Pi could just take the dictionary and parse it. So instead of just having to read the file, maybe subsurface can do the, the from file to Python, to a Python dictionary, the step, and that is attached to the primary structure. And then you can just take that primary structure and then you don't need to have the function that is capable to read GoCat because it's already a dictionary. Maybe yeah in super weird format, but that I like, that I like a lot. That would allow us to keep our, our objects 
here very simple, right? Super, super simple, readable, still readable, but uh, without having to have tons of parser to deal with all formats and stuff. But then it might then change if you have your data from subsurface stored as GOH5Pi or OMF or something else because not all of them might be able to store everything or is there another danger? No, but the idea is, is that uh, subsurface reads metadata in, non, in not any specific order. So it's, uh, and subsurface itself is not going to do anything with that. No, it's only going exactly. To the numbers. And then it's up to the libraries to, to just try to parse the dictionary in a clever way. So, yeah. so it, yeah. it's, it's tricky because obviously reading metadata, so for example, from a last file, uh, <sighs> even putting it in a dictionary is tricky. <laughs> You may, maybe you can just take the string and just place it there. But uh, what's in the last file that is complicated as well? They have huge header with information and it's not tabular data. So something as well is, is very good. Well, Welly. Welly last IO uh, and Welly is using last IO. It's very good at just taking that header that has a pretty bad format and just uh, parse it uh, in several dictionaries, not only one. Uh, but that is already a very specific use case. So, so when it's tabular data, if, if it's CSV data, I, I can imagine that it's relatively easy just to put in a dictionary, attach it to the object, that's it. If it's not tabular data, I guess that we can just make. I mean, look, the worst, case, the worst case, you just say header as your thing. And just so dump everything. <laughs> just yeah. dump everything into. Yeah, exactly. uh, just say your key is header. Sort it out yourself. Yeah. I don't know what to do with it. Exactly this. because I think uh, to keep subsurface simple, it shouldn't be the job of subsurface in the first place to format the header nicely. It's um, yeah. Just ah, yeah, yeah, I agree. It. Yeah. No, I, li I like it. I like it a lot. But, but I think if if you're coming out of something that's using say Welly, that you have got this nice uh, header data. I think that that's worth trying to keep at some level. Uh, whether that's subsurface, I'm not sure. But you know, if we're trying to build interoperability, it would be nice if you've run something through Welly and that's passed your head, your headers for you. It would be nice if, even if that is then just you know a dictionary with the string being a dictionary already or multiple dictionaries. Then when you read it into something else, you read the header and go, oh, there's a bunch of dictionaries here, and you can just pull that out in. I don't know what's going to use a gempy say. I, I I agree. So 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 for example, in this case, I'm I'm using Welly to start reading the well data, and then I go to to subsurface, and I just simplify the whole Welly object. But obviously, I can imagine some cases that someone wants to to just grab the Welly object, but but, but then it's not subsurface anymore. It's, it's really a Welly object and behaves as a Welly object. But there is no reason why we should delete it if if we are using it to import it. Also, I can imagine other cases, maybe in the future, that we will use a different library to import Warhol data. So, so, and, and you have both. You can import Warhol data either using Welly and Lasayo or whatever is coming in the future. So. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is that any function that reads to subsurface, it should create one structure or an structured data. All the rest is is uh, optional stuff. So if you use a different library and you create an object that could be interested, cool. But if not, no. but but that's why I think that the input output should happen to a, in a pretty low level to yes be able to uh, to homogeneize. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> The, the thing because if, if if we just put the input output to uh, and we are assuming a lot of uh, very complex structures then we are going to end up creating a new standard that is exactly what I, we don't want okay well so the, uh, um, basically now would be uh, of each of uh, of our libraries that were involved or you know that we're care about, we would be writing the to and from uh, subsurface. Is that, is that the idea, Miguel? 
going so, forward, the, the work to be done? Yes. So, so basically what I'm writing at the moment is, is a couple of functions that, that they are able to, for example, read borehole. And I, that creates either an, an structured data object or a structured data object, depending on, on which type of data is. So, so yes, so then I will expect that, that a library is able to read that. My, that GemPy. So, so for example, in, in the case of GemPy, I will try to, I will create a function in GemPy that is able to read an extract, an structured data and create GemPy structures out of that, and the other way around for the output. So the output of GemPy, for example, normally is a structured data. If you have a box cell with uh, a box cell box with with properties per cell, uh, then will be GemPy to subsurface, which will be an uh, a structured data, <laughs> and then from there we could export it to different formats. That is. Um, just a quick question there. You said um, that that should be able to, um, that the unstructured data is basically what everything needs to do. Um, are you including libraries that are inherently more structured? So, um, you know, if something's, I'm thinking of, for example, Verde, which does a lot of gridding, so you end up with gridded regular structures. Yeah, so, so, um, so this is the structure. Yeah, okay, so it needs, to man it needs to be able to do either structured or unstructured in subsurf format, whichever is most suitable, probably yeah. both for a lot of things anyway. Okay. So I, I, I can show you even the classes because they are super simple. So an unstructured data is a data class that has vertex, edges, and attributes. So the attributes, the idea was for the whole element that is created with the edges, but probably we need attributes for point data and attributes for cell data, like in BTK. And then I have a structured data that automatically creates a data set, an X-array data set. So these are the two. And with these two, then we can just go to the next level, which in this case would be point set. So point set takes data that is an structured data can be triangles. And all of these, for example, I have already a function to, to plot with, with VTK. So I can show you in the visualization, for example. So I have, if you have just a element that is a line, which a line has been composed by an unstructured data, you can just plot it with VTK as, as you expect. Uh, there you go. So yes, yes, very this similar. It's fantastic, man. It's gonna save me so much time. That's uh, great. And if you have an unstructured grid, instead being, um, sorry. So instead of being an, an, an structure that creates an element, it's a structured data uh, and the same thing. You can just do to PyVista grid and in this case runs. And creates structured data. So eventually everything is either unstructured data or structured data. That's, that, that's a bit my, <laughs> my point. So I, super, I, I, do you think these minimal QC plots would still be implemented in, in subsurface? The minimal what, sorry? So like these, let's call them QC plots, they are inbuilt in subsurface. Yes. Or, the, not, the, or yes, the, yeah. The thing is that once you have the data in that format, going from there to VTK is two lines of code. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cool. using it just to check that everything is, is working fine. So it doesn't bloat up the library, let's say, to have no. So, so, so utilities. If, if you want to go a bit into the actual structure, so I have it here subsurface. I don't know if you are able to see, or it's too small. Uh, no, it's fine. But I have the struct, which is what I have seen talking today. So the the base structures and then the elements, the input output functions for faults, grid, maybe softwares. Or whole. The interfaces which I wrote in the 
in the readme that technically are not necessary because in principle it's the other libraries, the ones that they are pulling and yeah. pushing to subsurface and not subsurface. So, so we shouldn't have from sub subsurface to GenPy in the subsurface. It should be GenPy, the one who is written yes. from subsurface. But in any case, just in case I create the folder here. Uh, and then visualization. And visualization at the moment is just by Vista. I could imagine also matplotlib functions or any other rendering. But yeah, so in but this they are sense... Pretty, so, so, so what I wanted to say is that it's pretty independent. Eh? So input, output, structures, visualization, and then geological format, which could be open mining format or anything. Yeah. Again, this is, a, this is a bit up to the people of these libraries if they want to import those libraries in subsurface and having everything centralized in subsurface, or if they want to do it the other way around. In their I, I think it's subsurface. it's good. Like it's more like let's say NumPy, and each project imports NumPy. And I think subsurface is more in this category that everyone should import subsurface and not the other way around. So, so, so the missing link for me was this idea of metadata. But but if we do this idea of of reading the metadata and putting it in a dictionary, then it makes a lot of sense to do it in that way. Now, Wayne, uh, because you commented there on the on the PR of Cho in, in the discretized library. Would it be sensible to have here a discussion about, like NumPy has this D type, and I don't know if, if here it would be an, in discretized I thought about M type for mesh, but then it's not everything is a mesh in subsurface, but some attribute that every object has that distinguishes it very clearly, something like D type, but for subsurface, have you thought about something like this, Miguel? So, I think it's a, a really good idea. And I guess um, really where that gets incorporated is when you go into the next level above those base structures. So when you start having uh, like triangulated surface as a class and things like that. And so that's sort of what I equate as the mesh type, um, right? Is keeping it really general. Like, is it a triangulated surface? Is it tetrahedralized? Uh, volume? Is it uh, a regular grid that makes, uh, you know, like a tensor mesh? Um, those sorts of things. And so it, it kind of depends on what you want to define that that data type, uh, whether that's the, the human interpretable formats, like, uh, I don't know, fault surface um, versus something else, um, or if you want that just to be the general mesh data structure, which, I mean, kind of gets incorporated once you start making these, these other classes that are, um, that have been implemented like structured surface, structured grid, and, and all of that. And what would be a good name for that? That that incorporates every possible. <sighs> Ooh, I don't know. So, I'm, I'm, so, so what Bain is calling mesh, I'm calling elements. I don't know if it makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like just every object like that has an element type or something, and then it can add whatever on top of that element type to extend it. But yeah, Does that, so, 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 so for me, the only question is if, if we really need to create a type or just refer to the classes. Yeah, totally. I feel like if you can see the inheritance classes, then you know what it is, but it just might be if you're like looking at a JSON definition of it or something, it's not obvious if the vertices are points right. or line vertices. <laughs> so, so, so I don't know. What, what, one thing I, I really see of this library in general and these ideas that we, we have been discussing today is that they are pretty independent to each other, uh, which I think that makes collaborate in this library relatively easy. So import and export to these basic data structures are completely an independent project that, that doesn't have to, to deal with the core plotting, same story, e even creating your own type of, of element. Say if you want to just do a combination of, of triangular mesh and with the squares or whatever, you just create a new object that is based on the primary data structures and, and that doesn't disturb anybody. So, so, so the good thing of this is that 
is not to entangle uh, any function with any other function. So I think that could make, so, so, so the main thing is having it centralized, right? that when someone wants to write a function to read some format, instead of just making its own function, they decided to do it in here. That's great, Miguel. Uh, what's the, so just the greater plan, are we, are we gonna implement IOs here? Or um, are we just gonna leverage the IOs from other libraries, right? Because we're not gonna, when send segway, right? You had segway IO, like we're not gonna rewrite this here. here. No. So what are we doing with all the other file types? And uh, at the moment I'm trying to, to use all the library, be, be, because actually I, I really think that for 95% of the formats, there is a library that is able to read. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I'm doing. Yeah, yes. And, and if you go to the task of subsurface, yeah, and normally I put links to the library that seems to be able to read those things. Yeah, right. There's only very few that still need to be written. And I guess if, if they're missing, then we can do it here rather than somewhere else. Yeah, I, I think it's a problem more of not knowing where they are. Yeah, the functions that, that, that they are not existing. Well, there, yeah, GoCAD, that was a good one. I don't think there's anything in Python that, that does it, that I know of anyway. So I guess something I want to clarify on this, uh, like from a user perspective, um, you know, a geoscientist, they just want to be able to call some module and say, load this data file. And they don't know the nuances of what open mining format or H5Pi, geo H5Pi is. Um, and so should we have like a catalog in subsurface that basically is a bunch of mixins that, you know, has, uh, keeps track of file extensions and where to point, you know, a read function to in geo H5Pi or OMF or, or, whatever other libraries do this IO. Um, should we have some sort of separate cataloging library that do all of the mapping of the IO and then the collection of all the data into the subsurface structures or, or should we require, you know, users to know that, um, you know, this file format with this extension, they need to pip install X module and use the interface directly in that, in that module. Yeah, I guess that was, that was, you know, my comment earlier was kind of, thinking about that, right? Like the geologists like me, right, is not gonna wanna get rid of all the metadata. I'm, I wanna keep all that stuff, right? So um, so if you strip it out, it's gonna make people super uncomfortable. And um, so I, you know, I, that's, just a, that's just the way, you know, they wanna know the names of their faults, for example, or, you know, whatever. And uh, so that's, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to, to think about some use cases for this, like from, from specific data type, seismic data, um, you know, seismic and well, and some faults, like, you know, if there's no coordinate reference system, is that gonna freak people out? Like, you know, all of these types of things. So um, anyways, yeah, I think it's a good point, Bing. But in one of the, oh. go right wrong. Uh, when, one of the things that we learned from OMF, like the first version, or I, I think like three things was, uh, and like one of the things that Dom, you said, like when uh, Miguel brought up the visualization is that's the first time you said like, that's going to save me a ton of work. And that's, I think what we want to like, that's what we want to aim for is people actually using this. So I think like visualization, including in the base is super important. And then the two things that we learned in OMF was the metadata. We didn't like, we weren't very flexible in OMF V1. Um, for including that and that bit us hard in adoption. Um, and so like having places in the code that can have that sort of unstructured metadata included in the library was very, very important. Um, and then the coordinate reference system, that side of things and having some places that we start to sort of agree upon um, like how how to actually include those properly so that we can read from them reliably to all of the different libraries and that that I think can be a process over time it's sort of like eroding from the just random header file into something that is actually more structured that we can like that can be a process over like releases of, of this library I, th I think on that note, there's a few that seem fairly obvious, you know, um, if you've got a CRS, it doesn't seem a, a major, major step to have a .CRS attribute if you have it. If you don't, you just say there isn't one. 
Um, it's just a question of how many of those do we want to allow. Um, I think something like a CRS for geoscience is probably fundamental enough that we should consider that one as that should be somewhere, somewhere, somewhere you should have a CRS associated with your data. Um, other ones, I guess it depends on what you're reading in a bit more. Um, yeah, and, everything's and, going to have a depth, for example. Yeah, and that's where that sort of pyramid, uh, Miguel, that you're saying that like that's where it starts to blow up, right? Because then everyone has a different schema and a different hierarchy about how they do things. And it just is too, we definitely don't want to get build use cases for all of that kind of stuff because be but, but but maybe so here is a bit a, a community decision and that's why this conversation is really good so, so i agree with you that if if we limit subsurface just to the numerical data and then we just make sure that other libraries like omf or dominics they are taking that and putting it in the library from a user perspective it's going to feel different that if everything is centralized in in subsurface and they can access to those formats and to the plotting and to the uh, reading and writing directly from one package with its documentation and those, those examples. I, uh, me personally, I'm not planning to, to work in these hu more human levels. Uh, and, and I think that you two have already done a lot of work on that. So it's not even necessary. There are already formats there. How we integrate those things is a good question. But I also think you, we can't even define all the possibilities and that will be, even though we are a very broad community and that will, but then that, that will depend from one community to another. So the ones that do gravity might say, oh, we need this or that attribute. But if you have a dict and they can agree within them, amongst them, that this attribute is called like this, and they can write it to and read it to, and you as subsurface don't even have to define that in a way. Yeah, we're not trying to merge packages here, right? We're just trying to pass information easily from one to the other. You're still going to have your package. You're still going to be in Willy doing your processing. Of, you just want to be able to send something to VTK to see it or send something for forward modeling, right? Uh, we just want to pass like small snippets. You're still going to have your own library to store all your metadata and do all the things that you want to do. I mean, I, I, I agree. Maybe then the, the better way to put it is, is more about the documentation. So it's not so much about merging libraries, as you said, but maybe really merging or centralize some examples in, in the subsurface package. But if someone go to the subsurface documentation, they can see how to import uh, something from subsurface and directly just put it in, in GOH 5Py uh, and, and then do whatever they want to do with that. But and if two libraries really want to pass a lot of stuff to each other because I don't know, we work closely or whatever, then you just increase the number of things that subsurface can, you know, structure things that subsurface is going to be able to pass from one package to the other and then that's it. <laughs> uh -huh. Increase it over time. So oh, um, tell me what to do, Miguel, and I'll uh, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so no, one, so, one, yep. so one last thing: is there any, is there anyone that's that's either in Equinor or you know, I mean, Equinor they've released enough of this kind of these types of things that I I feel like they must have thought about this type of I um, kind of think... base like low level scale thing. Is that We can ask, we can definitely ask uh, Jürgen, but I have the impression they have more uh, blocks like Segway.io, uh, this, this, or what's the other one called? Uh, because then in Ectilis, because then in Equino, they have obviously their own software packages that do these things, right? So I don't think they have something for exchange within the open space but we can definitely ask him i mean he's on slack and he's very open so when we were in the castles so this project is coming already from transform 2019 and he was there yeah and so. he was there and nobody said that ah, that exists with yeah. <laughs> uh and two years yeah, after still without existing <laughs> 
the the more I think about it, you know, what what um, what Dominic was saying about, you know, just like just transfer some snippets back and forth. I mean, that's the the biggest hurdle going from, for example, Patrell into Python or or Patrell into Kingdom, or you know, whatever. Like working as a right there, there's no like how, how do you read an Eclipse file? Like right, like or Segway data is like the Patrell loader and Segway is awful. It's just like the worst. So. So anyways, there like I think that that little software tab that you were showing, right? The kind of IO software thing, I think would be a place to collect some of these. I mean, I don't know, maybe you don't want to do that, but but there's a bunch of little pieces like, oh, get a patrol file into a, you know, into some type of array or something. There's all kinds of those little snippets kind of sitting out on GitHub and yep. Everyone's exactly. libraries, and they've all and they've all been done like twelve different times, right? Because someone can't find it, and so they recode it, and it's like three days worth of work. So, and, uh, and and it's difficult because many times you need to do a couple of manipulations to the input data, very specific to each case. Yeah. So so yes, create a function that is read x. That's going to be really a big challenge for all of us. But at least knowing that if you add some specific code, that maybe you can just put it somewhere and build something bigger that yeah that, that doesn't get lost so so, so so my my whole goal with this is, is trying to create a place where we can just write those interactions and they don't get lost yeah that's cool i like that idea not not much more to be honest <laughs> without increasing the dependencies right miguel you don't want to you don't want to increase the the requirements too much either so how do how are we going to be able to I totally agree with you, Zane. It would be awesome to have like a, a repository of like small snippets of stuff, but how do we do it without increasing our, our dependencies too much? My idea is, is optional dependencies. So optional dependencies, they are going to be a lot. But yeah. even, even X array, because if your data, you only have unstructured data, there is no reason why you should Could have be. to import yeah. X array, right? Yes. I do like the one thing that was suggested earlier, which is, you know, if possible, try and offload as much of it as from the user as possible. Um, so I th certainly not immediately, but I think that's something that we should look at doing. You know, if you give this thing a segway file that it knows, oh, I need it, segway, and it can then actually tell you, oh, you're trying to load a segway file, please install this and try again. Um, I think that would be very valuable if we can, because I think there's probably enough out there for, as, as somebody mentioned, for most of this stuff. Um, obviously not everything, but some, a lot of it's out there already. So, you know, but, but, but that's the goal. That. So, it's, so if we really start building up in a clever way, maybe in five years, we are able to have subsurface read and point into a file and that works. Uh, and, and seems crazy, but with Panda, sometimes you have that feel, that, that feeling that you just point somewhere and suddenly they are able to read it. And, and it's because of so many iterations. Of it. Uh, yes, and what you, uh, I also think that what uh, Lindsay said that um, from a user perspective, it would be nice to have this um, yeah, high level object with also the metadata. I think it's also very, similar from a feeling to a pandas data frame where you have this uh, fully fledged object with all the imports and exports methods available at your, at your fingertips but then you can still do the dot values and get the numpy uh, array below it so i think that this is very similar to i think uh, what we're aiming at so that we have these uh, hierarchy of objects that you described miguel in the beginning and for communication between the libraries, we focus on the on the more uh, yeah high level object with also metadata that we have to agree upon. Um, and then if yeah, but we still have these um, lower type objects that um, and then they are also saveable and readable. Um, so that but yeah, for for starters, we would focus on on an object which, yeah, I don't know, like a subsurface model, which um, 
can yeah also contain the the metadata and potentially also um, yeah cell and node based data is that correct or I, I, I think that the, the trick here is, or, or, or the way I'm, I'm thinking of it after this conversation is, the primary structures, they have to be able to read the files, numerical and, and beyond, but they don't need to make any sense of it, well, of the numerical placing it in properly, because either it's unstructured data or structured data, but all, all the, the metadata around it has to be able to read it, but doesn't need to, to parse it. And then we are building on top of it. And in each step, we are better uh, adapting that data that exists there into more human readable uh, structures. And then depending on the libraries, maybe they communicate at, at a very low level or they communicate to a very high level. So GenPy and PyVista, they communicate at a very low level because they are super similar. But if you really want to do seismic interpretation, maybe you need to really know uh, which parameters you were using for whatever uh, and building from there. And, and if, we, if everything works out fine, eventually we will have everything to, in all the levels. Eh? So very low level, just with numbers, very high level with already a lot of strings in a lot of fields uh, and being able to either export everything from top already with a structure in maybe an XML or just a, say if an umpire array on disk. Even, even if uh, you know two libraries talk at a very high level and you get dumped a dictionary with a bunch of stuff, as long as the, this stuff is always coming the same way, <laughs> at least I have a way to be able to talk to you in the library, you know, in a, in a systemic way, you know, I always get the same thing and then I know how to deal with it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I, I, I like this idea of adding one property to the primary structures of, of just being the, the container of a staff. <laughs> and I have another question with regard to dependencies. So, um, yeah, I like the idea of, of keeping it light and also with the idea to have potentially subservice as a dependency of all the other libraries that communicate with each other and it would make sense to to keep it light um, but we also don't want to reinvent the wheel so uh, said that x array also um, holds a lot of useful functions and i was just <clears throat> chatting with carsten who has no microphone but uh, he was mentioning mesh IO, which already also has a lot of um, input and output functionality for unstructured meshes. And uh, I, I personally never used it, but I know that it's a dependency of PyVista, I think. And maybe uh, Bain can comment on it um, because I think, because it's, I think, yeah, almost 10 or more than 10 different data files for unstructured. Uh, meshes and I would assume that they also have some some base layer underneath it uh, to allow for this communication. Uh, are you still there, Vane? Yeah, uh, yeah. So Mesh.io it is a dependency of PyVista um, right now, and basically we've created just a, a little wrapper on top of Mesh.io to uh, basically you can pass Mesh.io a file name and an optional file type. It tries to figure out the file type on its own, um, and then it will pull back um, a Mesh.io data class, which is very similar to kind of what we're developing here, um, but way more general. Um, and then we just convert that to a, a PyVista or a BTK data set. Um, and so I guess, you know, if we are already building a lot of interoperability here between Subservice and PyVista, um, we get all of that functionality from my Mesh.io um, just out of the box there. Um, so that's really interesting. I think Mesh.io is a good example for us to look into um, as far as how to structure these data classes in a minimalistic fashion, um, just because Mesh.io is pure Python. Um, I think it might have some Cython, but I'm not too sure. I think it's pure Python. Um, but they did a really, really good job of just generalizing how do you define an unstructured 
3D mesh, like uh, just you know general mesh data structures. So it's it's super general. I don't think it will work for everything we want to do here, but it's a really good example for us to sort of look into of, of how they approach that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so right out of the box, we can pretty much already gain all of MeshIO's awesome file IO, um, features. They they read a ton of different 3D mesh formats, um, and so since we're we're already building that interoperably with PyVista, we get all that. Does that mean that if you would put it very simple, that subsurface is a collection of mesh IO and X-Array and pandas or not? Mesh, mesh IO for unstructured, X-Array for structured and pandas, geopandas for surfaces or just asking? No, pandas is, is, is more also unstructured data. Yeah. So the mesh IO is, is a bit a level higher than NumPy and pa pandas is, is nothing else than NumPy arrays with, with labels. It's a dictionary yeah. of NumPy arrays. Yeah. So mesh IO is, is, is taking those NumPy arrays and making elements with, with those. I guess, no, Bay? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. I guess then if, we, if we're missing any importers, we should just do it there, either VTK, uh, either PyVista or directly mesh IO, or instead of uh, putting it here, can we just beef up their library instead if we're, if we're missing anything? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we're open to it in PyVista at least, but um, I think that's only the case for general mesh data structures, right? So PyVista is a super general library. Um, you know, we, we're happy to accommodate any general mesh format, but as soon as you start getting into niche geo formats, uh, I think it's better to host that either in subsurface directly or in another offshoot project of like subsurface IO, which can maybe handle all of those snippets that Zane was sort of referring to earlier of collecting all types of different ways to parse uh, niche formats. Yeah. I Fair like enough. that idea of sur subsurface IO because this IO sounds very interesting, but I think it, it could, det uh, it could get away a lot of energy from the main idea of subsurface to be a minimal package and also maintenance burden if you have all these readers. So yeah, I like it, but. I, I, I think that the, the best way to proceed there is, is just wait. So if eventually the input yeah. output is big enough and, and useful yeah. enough, we just split it. So far, the package is so small that it's not worth it to just split it in, th in three. But yes, the visualization, the data structures, and the input output, they are completely independent. So they could be its own packages. Well, actually, there are sub packages in, in the structure anyway. And just in terms of like having a lot of extra requirements on there, there's pretty easy, straightforward ways in setup.py to make it so you can only install the requirements you need. Yeah. So even if we have an importer that requires something, we can not make it mandatory. But the, is it possible to do it on the fly? I mean, probably, but it's not obvious. Eh? But if you just call one function that needs one requirement, they just call pip. If they don't take uh, it. Yeah, I don't know. That might be a little nice <laughs> here, no, but I, I'm sure it's I possible. Can, I don't think you can really like dynamically install something without I, some major hackery. That would be a high <laughs> risk thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could like have an error message that's like, "Hey, in order to run this, just run pip install uh, of subsurface IO, whatever segway or something." I agree. Yeah, I would. I would be as explicit in those kinds of instructions as possible because for for new coders that come in and they try to do something and they get some error message that, that is cryptic, instead, if you can like have a printout that says like hey, go to this website and check out this library. And by the way, the exact syntax to install this is to open up your terminal <laughs> and then type pip install, like, you know, whatever. Like, right, they, you need like, ver like the stuff that you guys think is like, oh yeah, that's like super simple to do. For someone that's not, you know, not in this world, it, that's, then they just close the, they just, they're like, eh, well, I tried. Well, whatever, it must be broken. So that's, yeah, I would try to make those things like as explicit as, but like to the level where you think it's not necessary to explain it, explain it. <laughs> Cause that, that kind of stuff's helped me a lot. Like when I was learning stuff, so. To everybody, yeah, that's true. But I guess that for those things, you also need a lot of iteration, error messages and things like that. It takes so much time. It's so boring to, to type. <laughs> 
Yeah, but dynamic installation on the fly would be too invasive, I would say. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, so thank you for this. I'm going to, so my idea at the moment is just adding a couple of, of input output more, but input especially, just being, being able to read four holes, definitely seismic and probably cloud of points, because that's what I want to, to play with in, in Genpy. After that, I am going to slow down in, in my developing of subsurface. So, that's that's a bit the tricky thing. Eh? So so we I, I think it was important to just start, to especially even if it's the people around us eh, that if at some point they ask uh, where they should put a function to read something, we can tell them just do it in subsurface. But I don't know how the whole thing is going to evolve. So so, so it's a tricky library because I have the feeling that has cannot be pushed by any of us. Has to evolve naturally as, as we are needing the new functionality. And yes, it would be pushed by us by implementing it in our libraries, right? Yeah. Yes. That's sort of the push we can do. And that's why we tried in the beginning to get PyGimli and Fatiando and Simpeg and PyVista and, and those in. Yeah. To start with, and then maybe write an example, each package in their docs, how to interface with, with subsurface. Uh, for a start. It's true. So, so, um, so uh, I, I was, I was going to say, I think, you know, we've probably got a decent chunk of the more stable, bigger geoscience libraries in Python. Um, you know, I mean, we're notably missing Segwire.io and a few others, I guess, but we've got a decent chunk of the big ones. So even if it is just pushed by all of the libraries that are represented here using it, I think that's probably enough to get it going and for people to take a bit of notice of it. So then I think that what I can promise is, I, I will try in the next couple of weeks once I finish that, to just make the first pip release and maybe even the Sphinx gallery. So yes, that even if it's very slim library, it seems a full library. And then I think it's a good moment to just leave it there and wait to see. But then it's just living there, then also maybe in general channel of, of uh, Swung, post it, let yeah. people know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, because now it's confined in the subsurface channel, right? And we're, yeah. well, it's still there are 90 people in it, but yeah. No, but, but, but today, for example, I was already importing workhole data and visualizing it for, for, via Welly and strip lock and visualizing it in by Vista, that, that as far as I know, I've never seen it. So I, I can make a couple of examples like that so yeah. that they can see that it's a full library and hope that people get interested. And maybe if there's someone with a big uh, designer skills, Rowan, then someone can make a symbol for it and then we have some visual recognition and uh, <laughs> then it's easier as well to sell it. I'm not too worried about having a huge user base, right? We're writing this for us. I mean, uh, <laughs> we're just trying to use each other's packages e easily. And like, it's going to be, a, of course, like people that have like advanced skills. It's, like, it's not for public consumption that much, I, I think. So thank you, Miguel, for, for starting this. Um, as soon as the, as the, uh, you know, the project shows up, which is going to happen in the next month or, or so, I'll, I'll definitely going to pitch on. Yeah, for me, it would be really useful. And if you, Dom, could make an, uh, an example how to write GOH5Pi using subsurface, because then then I'm all in. And then you could save a Simpeg thing to GOH5Pi through subsurface, and I can load that up. And yeah. That would yeah, be for Simpeg, it's, it's going to be super nice, right? Because uh, we're like our IOs, or they, they kind of suck. They're not really well maintained. So if we could just pipe through, uh, you know, create all our stuff as a subsurface object, then I think it would clean things up. I think I'm going to make a, a bit of a roadmap of, of tasks, but I think that if we are able to just take import boreholes uh, and maybe topography from subsurface, an, an example, how to do that, visualizing it, take that, put it into GemPy, getting the output of GemPy, create a subsurface object, we put it into Simpeg. <laughs> uh, and maybe also once we import it on, 
from subsurface. We are also showing how to embed it into GOH5Pi. Uh, then we Pass have the ball. The, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but then we saw the whole potential, eh? and, and th those could be three or four examples. And then from there, I think that it's easy for everybody to see what is the idea and start building on that. So yeah, let's, let's try to have that in the next couple of months. Fine by me. You can cool. celebrate New Year's. So I guess it's a good moment to wrap it up after. 70 minutes. The first one already leaving board. <laughs> <laughs> or is there anything else? Or should we maybe also about next time, should we just see how it goes or by the end of the year? Or Florian, we, we put the task up to Florian to ask again where, where everybody's <laughs> standing. Uh, that, that's important because I didn't start working on this until you made this appointment. And it's like, shit, <laughs> now, now I really have to, to, to allocate a couple of weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> chain is working yeah end of the year sounds good <laughs> okay this feels like homework now thanks stack of priorities you know <laughs> Sh shuffle stuff okay guys cool. have a good yep. evening wherever you are yeah. thanks everyone for joining great to see you yeah everyone stay safe everyone <laughs>